Welcome to Deep Dive MH370, episode 23, The Simulator. Hello again, my name is Andy Tarnoff, and I am the publisher and founder of On Milwaukee, a daily magazine, city guide, and media company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I am joined by journalist, author, the guy who wrote the definitive compendium to the mystery of MH370, Jeff Wise. Jeff, we're back. We spent a lot of time looking at the book for this episode. <laughs> Shameless plug the here. The taking of MH370. Thank you for plugging my book. I it love is, it. I think that your compendium makes it sound like it's a very daunting thing. It's actually a quick read. I tried to put everything in as, as succinctly as possible. But I was I was going back and looking at the book, actually, because I do have a chapter on the subject we're talking about today, which is the flight simulator that Captain uh, Zahari Ahmad Shah had in his basement. And it wasn't something he was shy about. He had videos about it on YouTube. But for some people, it's the definitive piece of evidence in the whole case. Yeah, it's the thing that changed people's minds. It's the thing that they used in the Netflix documentary, I think, as an anchor to say, okay, the pilot did it. Right. And the way I see it, as we're approaching the 10th anniversary of the, you know, the disappearance of MH370, this is sort of the remaining major elephant in the room that we need to address and talk about in detail before we get to laying out our specific theories of what happened and what didn't happen. Yeah, we're t this is um, our third from last episode before the anniversary. And as I've been kind of hinting at for the last few episodes, we're going to lay some pretty heavy stuff on you guys. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be kind of a blockbuster and you're right. There's sort of an elephant in the room. Uh, this is the piece of evidence that I don't know if it changed people's minds, but I think for people who already were prone to suspect that Zahari took this plane, it was really the last nail in the coffin. I think for, for a lot of people, um, I mean, particularly I'm thinking about Victor Ianella, who is a person that has been very influential in this case. And we've talked a lot about he um, for a while was really considering the possibility that this plane uh, had been uh, hijacked by through a uh, sophisticated spoofing attack. Right. But today, even though he was really the, the one who did the most to, to bring forward the mathematical understanding of that spoofing attack, he himself now says, I don't think that spoof was actually executed. Um, I, I, and the two pieces of evidence that he cites are one, the debris and two, the Zahari flight simulator, the topic we're going to talk about today. So you and I had talked about this before we shot the show and we said, look, we're kind of going to bring things to a head in the next three episodes, um, particularly the last two. And so let's clear away this major hurdle, which is that a lot of people are going to say, of course, the pilot had to do it. This flight was found on his flight simulator. It closely matches the, the Inmarsat data flight to the south. So it must, be, it must be correct. It's a major Rorschach test, I think, for people, because just like everything else in this mystery, you see what you want to see. And our goal here is to show everything. And then, again, I keep using the word totality, but look at the totality of the mystery. So you're not just looking at one thing, because it is quite easy to say, like, oh, that flight simulator, that shows you did it. But yeah, you're right, Andy. These, these, these themes keep recurring in the show. One of them is that you have a tendency to perceive, you know, uh, that which, you know, comports with what you already believe. Um, but then also... Um, there, there is the necessity to see things in context. And, and another theme that we talk about is that you, things look different when you look closely. Right. So if all you know is that there was this flight simulator data that matched what, ha what, what authorities thought happened to the plane, it kind of seems cut and dry. But we, if you look closer and you see the granularity, nuance emerges. And, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to, we're going to talk about the, the, the sort of big picture of what the, what, the, what the flight simulator data was. And then we're going to try to tease out the details about what exactly it, it said. Now, before we do that, Jeff, I think that we would be remiss if we didn't discuss a very major thing that happened in the news in the world yesterday. Because as we talk about, this is, it's not, well, it's not a live podcast. We are yeah. recording these episodes a few days before we release them on YouTube and Spotify and Apple Music and um, the apparent assassination or very obvious assassin assassination of Alexei Navalny in an Arctic Circle gulag by Putin was 
by no means a surprise to anyone, but it does speak to the continued ruthlessness of this guy. And that speaks to, you know, our overall theme that the concept of Russia taking this plane is right in line with the kind of stuff that this regime does. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I would agree that like nobody was um, surprised. I think a lot of so I, somebody I saw on Twitter, somebody today was saying, like, I thought he was immortal. I thought he was invincible to the extent that we're still capable of being shocked by Putin's brutality. Um, you know, I, I don't know how much like surprise we have left in us. So you, you, but this you, is, we should you were say surprised? That to, you were surprised that he was killed I don't, in prison? I mean, I, I, you know what? Honestly, I feel like the fact that Navalny, Navalny struck me as a, as a very savvy character. Like he kind of had a big picture understanding of how Russian society worked. And I thought the fact that he got on that plane and went back to Russia, he must have known that he was somehow safe. And obviously he was wrong. I mean, I think... And, you know, there's echoes of Prigozhin. I, I do want to say, Andy, that the, today is Saturday, February 17th, just so like people who are looking back on this, like in the future are going to be like 2024. Are yes. 2024, <laughs> if, Saturday, February 17th. This ha he was he would the, the news of his death was big news yesterday, Friday, February 16th. So context. Yeah. I wasn't surprised. I thought that uh, that this was an eventuality that would come soon. And I was actually surprised that Putin kept him alive this long, but I guess that's neither here nor there. You you had proposed that we do a whole episode about Navalny's death. I thought that it's definitely germane to how this project is going to eventually run, um, but I thought it was too early. Um, we okay. have talked about Russia. We have talked about Putin and the brutality and the savagery and also the sophistication. I mean, Russia uh, is... I think throughout history it has been like, has had a combination of like extreme intellectual achievement and also brutality. And these that's things accurate. coexist. Yeah, that's accurate. So actually you said that we were wrapping up for the, uh, the 10th anniversary. We're not wrapping up the podcast and we're not even wrapping up the season. We're just coming to um, a revelation, um, a theory, a thesis, and then we're going to continue to, get even more granular. There's a lot, it's there's a lot a left to do. It's kind of a crescendo, I think, but yeah. we'll see. We'll let the viewers decide. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the simulator. And I got to tell you, the more I looked into this, my head started to spin here. I mean, as a kid, that's, who used to that, play that flight simulators. Of, that's the, what our bump, that's what the bumper sticker says for this whole show. It's like, what is that? What? Like we're getting into some really detailed, like how, you know, windows saves files and we stuff. don't need to get that level. Of detail. No. And, and there are people who do, and I'm not even going to pretend to be at that level of sophistication. Nor uh, So, you know, if you, if, if you watch this and listen to this and say this isn't the uh, definitive guide to the flight simulator, then I apologize for that in advance. But I don't think, I don't think it one. needs to be. Let's okay. talk about what is the base. Like, what is the flight simulator? Like, what, are we, what even is this flight simulator? All right. So this guy, Sahari, was an accomplished pilot and he loved flying. And he had been flying for, what, like 30 years or something? He was one of the most senior pilots in Malaysia Airlines. And like a lot of other pilots, he had his own home flight simulator, which was better than most of most people's flight simulators, which is, you know, like a little computer with with, uh, you know, a keyboard or maybe a joystick. This guy had a fairly sophisticated, but not incredibly sophisticated, but he had a, he the had a hardware, good flight simulator. I mean, the, the hardware wasn't uh, the, the, com the computing power. It was a pretty normal Microsoft compatible PC, but he had it rigged up to four screens and he had like the pedals and all this yeah. stuff. Yeah. So I think like in terms of computation, it wasn't super sophisticated, but he had like a part of his basement dedicated to this thing. So it was clearly, and he made videos about it and put it on YouTube. So it was, it was clearly um, important to him. And he uh, went, so to make a long story short, after, after his plane disappeared and he had made these YouTube videos, there was no surprise that he had this thing in his basement, but the Malaysian police went and searched his house. So they were looking for evidence. Did this guy commit mass murder, suicide? Let's mm -hmm. look for notes that he wrote saying, I hate the government. I hate my wife. I want to kill everyone. They were looking for evidence. And part of the evidence they looked at was, can we find on his flight simulator hard drive flights where he did what we think he did yes. or suspect that he did? And they found one. They found one that, that some people thought was close enough to the flight into the southern Indian Ocean. Yes, and 
Yes. They found 600. They found over 600 flights. Okay. Right. So he'd had this thing for years and he flew it fairly often. I mean, as I was reading, I was rereading the material about this. I was thinking if I had a flight simulator like that, how much would I use it? Yeah. Because, you know, you, you have like a fun game on your computer, but like you don't spend all your time doing it. You're a grown. He's a grown man. Right. Right. Um, so, but he would every once in a while, he like his day off, you know, he's, he's not, he traveled a lot, obviously as an airline pilot, but he, when he was back home and he had some time off, he would go to the basement, fire it up and like do a flight. And he, he, so he did like at least 600 that we know about just from the evidence on the, not all triple sevens. No, he had a, a DC three, he had a seven, three, seven, his, um, like his, his handle in some social media uh, applications was PBY Catalina or something like that, which is a which is a an amphibious airplane that was a big deal in World War II. So he okay. loved he like kind of loved classic aircraft. He loves all kind of aircraft. It's so I mean, player. for fun, you know, flying a DC three from it was from the thirties actually. Oh, thirties. Okay. All right, was, okay. Okay. Was... I mean, so you know that that's not like a fl- he was flying for fun. He was using his flight simulator for fun, not so much for for work training, because if he was going to be using it for work training, he'd probably be in a real flight simulator and not, you know, a Windows 2000 Microsoft flight I mean, or whatever. I don't know. Those things aren't mutually exclusive. I mean, sometimes you might think, oh, I wonder what a, a DC-3 flies like. I mean, I wonder what its climb rate is. I wonder how like okay. how nimble it is. Does it, does it, what is its turn rate and stuff? Um, but then you might also feel like, hmm, you know, I wonder what it would, what would I do if I did like, if I was in Sully's situation and what if I had like lost engine power at 3000 feet, what would that be like? Um, yeah. So, you you know, it, it wouldn't be, a, uh, it wouldn't give you a r- super realistic answer, but you know, if you're, if you want to know like in the ballpark, what it would be like, it could be fun. I'm sure he would, I could imagine him doing something like that. I mean, I, you know, I'm not a real pilot, but I certainly played with flight simulators as a kid and as a teenager in college and flew all sorts of planes. And I usually crashed them because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, um, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm dancing around this topic a little bit, but what I'm saying is out of, out of all these files, one of them, which by the way, did happen to occur about a month before the accident, showed him flying up the Malacca Strait and then turning into the Southern Indian Ocean until fuel exhaustion. Right. So to put it in context, um, in March, he disappears. Um, the Malaysian police, you know, take his, the hard drive. There was a bunch of hard drives that were associated with his flight simulator. And they he had two different versions of flight simulator on different hard drives. So mm-hmm. I guess if he want to choose different i don't know why you would do different versions i would personally just do the best one but anyway he had different versions they took them they found the flights they found one flight that looked particularly suspicious it had been carried out um on february 2nd he 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 had a session where he sat down on his day off and he played for 70 minutes and he flew and he and he did this and he did that we don't know exactly what he did the, the the program doesn't record everything you do but if you get to a point where you save it um, or it auto auto saves, um, then you, ha- then there's a record left on the hard drive. And so we don't have a, 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 a an exhaustive knowledge of what he did that day, but we have six data points from that session. So this is kind of like if you were, if you're writing a document in Microsoft Word and it would auto save without you yeah. hitting the command S or the control S and it would tell you the last place it had a save point. For present purposes, yes. We're not going to get into the nitty gritty yet or maybe okay. ever about what exactly kind of file this was or what the program was that, okay. that recorded it. But for present purposes, let's say that he he, he did a 70-minute flight session and it's there were six points within that session that the data was saved. Okay. Um, and then in, his, in historical context, Mal- the, the Malaysians gave this um, information to the Australians in April. And then, but the public didn't know about it. There were rumors that were circulating. Um, a, a journalist or two dropped a hint in a, in a publication, but nobody really knew about it. And it wasn't until 2016 that these files leaked out. And I and they were leaked to me, and I published a piece in New York Magazine. And I, I went back and I reread the piece, and it was like, I wrote, like, this basically is a very damning piece of evidence that, like, puts the blame on Zahari. 
Yeah. Um, and I wonder how much of that was my editors and how much of me was just like anticipating that that's how my editors would want me to write it. Because right. then on my blog, like a month later, I was like, you know, actually it's more ambiguous than that. But I hadn't had a lot of time to look at it. We just knew what the the, the, the gist of the case was, which maybe we can we can just describe, like, what does it seem yeah. to say? And then we can go a little dig a little deeper. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So, you know, the, the flight takes off from Malaysia, which is where he's from. And right, from Kuala up, Lumpur International Airport, right? which is and, his home base at yeah. Malaysia Airlines. So that alone isn't damning because that's where his home base is. It flies up the Malacca Strait, turns south, and there it goes. It doesn't well, match a lot of the other things that happened. It doesn't have anything to do with Agari. It doesn't have anything to do with turnbacks. Okay, and it didn't so even go about, to so, the same place where the the Seventh Arc is. Okay, so there's there's six data points. The first one is on the ground in Kuala Lumpur. Um, so he took off from Kuala Lumpur, as he usually did. Um, and then he flew up. The, the, so so the first, uh, I, okay, the first one is on the ground in, in the airport. The second one is up to Malacca Strait. The third one is further up to Malacca Strait. And then if you continue in a straight line out over the Andaman Islands, which belongs to India, this is sort of further out into the middle of the Indian Ocean, there you have the fourth one. Okay. And then it's, that's the fourth one. And then there's two more and they're way far south and they're, they're 45 degrees south. It's, it's deep, deep, deep remote Southern Indian Ocean. Um, so how does this look like the last mysterious flight of MH370? It does not go east to Agari. It mm -hmm. doesn't do a 180 degree turn back. It doesn't fly back over Butterworth. It goes right to the part where he's flying up the Malacca Strait. So it is like MA370 only in that it goes up the Malacca Strait and then it winds up in the Southern Indian Ocean. I mean, we've got to put this in perspective here. When we were talking about this offline, we were saying like if you were doing a flight simulator game from New York, you yeah. would take off maybe from New York. It might be extremely strange if you took off from Kuala Lumpur right. and you were piloting a plane that disappeared while being someone who lives in new york but he took off from where he lives and from his home airport right so base. if my job was to fly from jfk to heathrow every day and you find on my flight simulator a flight of me taking off from jfk and flying up long island sound um that might not seem that weird okay this sort of gets confusing or at least a little insider baseball he didn't actually sit and play this flight simulator for six hours or seven hours. Like he skipped ahead, right? Like he, he set the, he clicked a, a spot so, on the map to make the plane just, you know, move there. Right. Cause you don't, who wants to play so a flight couple simulator of people, for seven hours? A couple of people um, got the kind of computer that he had and got the sim, the, the flight software that he had and tried to recreate what he did. And so we looked at, and then we saw, well, what kind of file, does our computer make, does it, how does it relate to what he did? And so I did it, Victor Ianello did it. Victor and I kind of came to slightly different conclusions. Okay. Um, and I don't have a great deal of faith in my ability to decipher computer stuff. I mean, I don't. So, but this is what I, this is what I felt like I saw, okay. which is that Zahari took off from Kuala Lumpur, flew up the Malacca Strait, by hand, meaning he is riding it like a bicycle. He's like putting in hand inputs yeah, and he's basically aiming in a certain direction. He's not flying from waypoint to waypoint and he's not on autopilot. Um, you know, it's like um, if you drive a car, you're going to like not exactly fit the lanes. You're going to move a little bit side to side right. versus like if you're on a monorail, you're going to go on a line. And so yeah. if you're, if you're on autopilot, you're like on a monorail. Mm -hmm. Victor looked at it differently. Victor looked at it and he said, um, this guy actually, I think was on autopilot. And I mean, what, I, I'm looking back and I'm like, why did we even argue about that? Who cares? The point is he flew up the Malacca Strait by hand or, or on autopilot. He, he got to this um, fourth point which is over the Andaman Sea. And then he didn't turn south per se. What he did was, as he's playing this, this program, he manually repositions the planes to the far south. So it's, right. it's sort of like he teleported the planes down yeah. to the remote ocean. I think they call that fast travel in computer games, where you don't have to actually do all the travel. You just say, this is where I want to go. 
Okay. Thing. I it's didn't a thing. know that. It's fast travel. So we fast traveled down to the Southern Indian Ocean, which is interesting because if the thesis is that the fact that, that these the, these six points suggest that he was practicing stealing the plane and flying it into the Southern Indian Ocean, like what are you practicing? Like the hard part would be this like six seconds after Rigari, you do you off the thing and you bank it and all this great. And then you fly for Butterworth and you're, you're flying at a really high speed. And like, that's, that's like the high tension Tom Cruise kind of action. Yeah. Um, he skips all of that. He goes to the part where I'm going to turn South and he, I mean, what is he, what is he simulating? He's because to me, it's like the thing that he's going to do that he's never done before is is take a plane and point it into the darkness of the night and fly over empty ocean for six hours while thinking about how he's about to die. Yeah, that's what's different, and that's he doesn't do that. He he takes it right down to the southern ocean. Here's another thing that I find kind of hard to get my head around. He when he takes it because there are these two final ports points and they're only a few miles apart. One comes before the other. The first one. Um, he's at like 35,000 feet. I forgot. I'm getting it wrong, but I think it was a little higher than that, but that's okay. 40,000 feet. It's something it's like high. that, but it was within, it was within the range of, of normal operating. I think it's within the, the Upper, ceiling of yeah. the plane. Yeah. He wasn't in space or anything. Right. Right. But anyway, so he's, so he sets it. So he's got it at this relatively high altitude. He manually positions the aircraft and he manually sets the fuel to zero. Which intriguingly, this is probably has no significance, but if you've set this, the fuel to zero um, on a flight simulator, it actually doesn't make the engine stop. You actually have to throttle back the engines as well. Oh, okay. But the idea being like, he, the, the thing that he is simulating at this point is a plane with no engine power, like a plane that has run out of fuel or it's like ingested geese or whatever, for whatever reason, its engines don't work anymore. Yeah. And this is kind of uncanny because not only is this plane in, gone from the Malacca Straits down into the Southern Ocean, like the Marsat data suggests, the, the MH370 did, he's also out of fuel, like the Inmarsat data suggests the plane was out of fuel at, on the seventh arc. So at first glance, and this is what I say when you look at it, like just at first look, it seems like this is exactly what happened to MH370. He's in the op open ocean, in the middle of nowhere, with no f with no engines, and now what? So this would kind of make sense. Like, okay, now you're in this place and you have no engine power. You are doing what the plane seems to have done. Mm -hmm. But, um, <laughs> well, but oh, and then let me just talk about the second. Then there's a second point, which is kind of the same situation. But it's at three thousand feet, so it's it's again out of fuel, no power, and it's lower. So it seems like he was. This is what happened to the plane. Um, so I get why people think, okay, case closed. But um, why? So when you're over the ocean. Especially, well, I guess they, this would have happened in the early morning. But you're over the open ocean, and to me, all open ocean is the same. Like, what does it matter if you're if you're going to experience what it's like to put a plane down? Um, what does it matter if you're here or over there? I mean, just you you're you're gonna it's the it's the surface of the ocean that you're thinking about. So I find that kind of weird. Another weird thing is that. The Inmarsat data suggests that the plane, after it ran out of fuel, got pushed down into a steep and accelerating dive. It basically nosedived into the ocean. So you, so you went from, we don't really know what it started at, 40,000 feet, 30,000 feet, 20,000 feet. We don't know. But it, you put the nose down and you're in the ocean, you're in the water in less than a minute. Yeah. That's not what happened here. That's not what this is showing. If you look at the speed and the, and the rate of climb, uh, it's actually close to the speed that you would fly if you're trying to glide and 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 get as far as you can. And it's actually going up, hmm. which is which is a little bit surprising. You think, okay, it has no engine power. How is it going up? Well, you can you can actually you know even a glider 
you know, yeah, you, go up. You, you put the nose down and you pull the, yeah, you get, the get stick speed back and, then and, you, you, and you gain yeah, speed and yeah. you lose altitude. You gain speed, you lose altitude. Yeah. So it looks like he was practicing to glide. I mean, I guess the, the thing is, like, he could have changed his mind. I mean, he could have simulated one thing and then done something different. It could have been his v vision of this suicide mission. It could not have been. I mean, and then for the subsequent <clears throat> month, he like continued to do other flight simulator stuff. It wasn't even anything to do with this. Yeah. So, yeah, let's talk about the state of mind that it gets implied. Oh, the one thing I should say also is that the second, so the first point is like when the plane first ran out of fuel. The second point is it, it's not like he's now lower down and he's like diving it into the ocean. It's actually, again, he's it seems like he's gliding, trying to um, ex extend his, his, uh, his flight as long as he can. And I, I, you know, I said, look, this is a little bit like what um, Captain Sullenberg For experienced sure. uh, in the Miracle on the Hudson, where he hit these geese, and it wasn't because he was out of fuel, but it was because he hit these geese and his engines were broken. Yeah, and he was at about three thousand feet, and he had to figure out what to do, and he wound up ditching in the ocean. And so I thought, okay, maybe he was practicing a suicide mission, but maybe he was practicing being Sully. I mean, maybe you got, got up I, for I don't know maybe got I, up for a like, cup of coffee, and you know came back to the computer and it was doing something different. I, but I, I mean, or maybe not, but I just, I don't know if I find any of this particularly persuasive, particularly because this was just one of his many flights. So he wasn't right. doing so this over and over and over flights. and over again. And well, it, it is unusual. I mean, listen, he did, if he did 600 flights, like one of them is going to look weird just by chance. Right. I would think so. Um, the, but and and this again, it's like there's pros and cons. Okay. In the in the column of yes, Zahari did it. Um, I would put the fact that this what this wasn't his last flight, but it was one of his last flights. It was on February second. The plane disappeared on March eighth. Um. So and he did he had done one the day before where he was flying a DC three, which I think we talked about, and then a couple weeks later he's flying a seven thirty seven. And you and I were talking about this, Andy. Uh, personally, I'm like, if you're, if you've decided to die, if you've decided to commit a terrible crime and take your own life and kill the 238 other people who have been entrusted into your hands, and then you're like playing just for fun, you're just playing for fun. That seems strange to me. I don't think someone who's who's getting themselves ready to die. Would it, would it, would enjoy playing a video game? It seems you think they'd be me. singular, singularly focused on that, unless they were trying to create a diversion or something. But you know, now we're just like wildly speculating on this guy's state of mind. And in fact, we're not the only. Well, some people speculated not wildly on his state of mind, including you know the FBI, the Australians. I mean. You know, they, they continued to not say this guy looked like he was a mass murder suicide um, candidate. Um, a year after MH370 disappeared, I did a Kindle single um, about Adrian Lubitz, who was kind of inspired by MH370 to actually commit mass murder suicide. Yeah. Um, and the book is called Fatal Descent. You should definitely buy many copies and give them to your friends and loved ones. I'd, but, I'd put that up on the screen, but I don't have that, but you don't have it yet. Yeah. You will. <laughs> <laughs> There's your interstitial folks by Jeff's other book. Okay. But know. you're right. No, no, no. We're talking about a guy who, a guy who did crash a plane and had different sort of behaviors. And he had a history of mental health issues and he had on his computer, he had searched for, um, how to like how to commit mass murder suicide? How to crash a plane? And he had searched actually Zahari Amacha. So that's not surprising. A guy who does this heinous act, like does you know, if you look at somebody's Google searches, it's like a look into their brain, right? Um, and what's amazing is that when they looked at Zahari's hard drives, they found um, they found um, records of Google searches that he had made. Yeah. And they were all for things like, how do I fix my broken flight simulator? Yeah. I mean, this guy, 
I think that like, yes, this, I, I do think this is probably the most damning piece of evidence against Sahari, even though I think it's flawed. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the, the, the fact that it is the most damning piece of evidence exists in the context of everything else which isn't damning against Sahari. You and I earlier in this show, we looked at some video that he had put on YouTube of him fixing a leaky window. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people look at that and they see a guy who's sending coded messages through newspaper headlines, right? Um, To my mind, there is the fact that this is that this is the only thing that suggests Sahari did it. And that this is pretty ambiguous to me really is a story about a guy who doesn't seem to have any red flags where there's one red flag and it's like kind of a pink kind of washed out red flag. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to say that it's ridiculous to think that that flight simulator flight was his one dry run on the most complex yeah, I am. I'm saying. I'm saying that that just doesn't like. <laughs> come on. No, I, I mean, he was a very good pilot, so maybe maybe he just needed one dry run to do this and had it all in his his head. But that's a that's a stretch to me. I do think if there was a session where he gets to the edge of Malaysian airspace and does a hard turn, that would be pretty damning. I think but that like, would be much yeah. less ambiguous than this. But like you said, that's the hard part. That what what he simulated in the flight simulator was the easy part: flying yeah. over the ocean, ocean, and turning off, or, you know, and cutting, cutting all the fuel. Like that doesn't take. That's not the the mastermind stroke here. I, I don't know. I I I I pretty much agree with you, but I'm 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 willing to say, look, I'm gonna, let, let me put it this way: if it turns out that Zahari did do this, we'll look at it in a whole nother light. But right. but it'll be a story in which there's a guy who just with an impeccable mm-hmm. emotional control set out to do something that speaks to a complete absence of humanity, total cruelty, yeah. total depravity, and presumably a really deranged and disturbed mental state. And I just want to say one more time, I, sure. I think there's just a big difference between uh, suicide and mass murder suicide. Yeah. I mean, it takes a really special kind of evil person to not just kill themselves, but to kill all those people and do it with the intention of hiding it forever. It doesn't add Yeah, up it was me. really interesting to spend some time, you know, I actually went to Andreas Lubitz's hometown and I, and I talked to some people who, who knew him who flew with him even. And um, this was a guy who was, he had, he was, it was a trajectory. Like the, yeah. the, the ending as shocking as the ending was, it like kind of lined up with where his life had been heading. Yeah. He was in a state of desperation. He was very self-centered. He was very disturbed. Um, and it, 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 I wouldn't say it made sense, but it sort of, it made sense within context. And with and with Zahari Shah, you're basically positing like this guy not only did like carried out the most technically complicated and involved mass murder suicide, but also did it also carried out a a, a feat of 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 commensurate uh, difficulty of just completely hiding any sign. I mean, even in the pictures of him before the flight leaves he's looks he looks inc- incredibly relaxed so he had to be like a master thespian okay i just want to bring up one more thing before we wrap this um and cuz it's something that i didn't know it's a report and a quote from this report and you can i'll i'll read the quote and then you can tell me a little bit about it it says okay. from the file profiling analysis conducted it is found that the exhibit MK26 was heavily used to conduct internet related activities from 15th september 20th 13 until 15th march 2014 okay what's that last second date again march 15th 20, 2014 after after the plane was a week after the plane disappeared so am so, i reading this correctly that that someone looked at his computer and found that it was being used a week after the plane disappeared Is his that computer was being used to conduct internet activity we don't know actually what that activity was 
we do know that he had used this computer to make searches for how do I fix my flight simulator. Um, but it's a bit, you're like, wait, excuse me. Yeah. I mean, what? did maybe his wife went down there and used it uh, Just... or, or maybe um, there was some speculation that after the plane disappeared, like the intelligence agencies of, of United States and, and Russia and China, like kind of went in and, and started and planting stuff or something. To, well, more likely like trying to figure out if he did it. Okay. What report is that from? That is from the Malaysian police report, I, I believe. Okay. It's, that seems a little... It's pretty weird. weird, right? I think so. I mean, so after we started this podcast, a guy from Australia who had a flight simulation, a flight simulator company, they have an A320 um, at an airport near Sydney. And he reached out to me and he said, I want to show you this theory. For this He didn't call it a theory. He said, like, I found out the, the, the truth. The oh, truth right. This, of course. Sure which is did. that actually it's impossible. Like the flights, the, the software cannot make these six backup points. And he sent me these long documents. And frankly, I can't, I, I don't have the chops to really make sense of it. I'm going to talk to him and see if I can, if it's worth yeah. delving into more. I was sympathetic to him though, because I felt like he was trying to, he was trying to make a point to me using somewhat, sophisticated information and i was pretty much like resistant to it i'm like that sounds that sounds pretty crazy and i don't understand the the, the evidence that you're throwing at me so i'm kind of reluctant to listen frankly and i and i think that that's how a lot of people respond to me yeah i can and yeah you're probably right i mean the, when you say you're an anti or when i say you're an anti-conspiracy theorist um what does that really mean? What it drove home to me is like, if I wanted to delve into what this guy is saying, what I need to do is find another expert who has no stake in the game and, right. and ask this other person, is it true that, um, you know, Microsoft Windows doesn't access the shadow drive, da, 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 da. And see if what, he, if, see yeah. if, and see if, if, if what he's saying, and then, and then that might be worth, um, spending more of my time and energy on it. But at this point, I feel like it's probably not worth it because I just don't think it's that probative. I think that when this mystery is solved, you go back and look at the flight simulator and you'll either conclude that it was a red herring or it was the first significant clue. Yeah. But I'm I don't think it really points us that way right now. I'm sorry if this episode seemed a little boring. I mean, it's it's just really hard to <laughs> it's hard to conclude much from this, but it's something that we have to talk about. Do you right? think it because, was boring, really? I don't know. I mean, maybe the, the the comments will tell us. Which, by the way, please like and subscribe and leave comments. Oh, yeah. The comments have been so good lately, Jeff. I think the comments have been really good. I think people really care about this case and they know a lot about it. Um, and if if you were listening if there's anyone out there that's still listening to this episode <laughs> yeah do tell us what you think because it, it really is i think a case of the it's the truth is in the eye of the beholder yeah no i think that that's kind of the gist of this one but it's like we said i mean we've held off until episode 23 to talk about this because it's an important piece to get out of the way i just don't think there's a whole lot more that we can say about it it's like you know you know believe like it or not that he that he that he flew this plane based on that data or he didn't it's part of my ongoing project to not be a conspiracy theorist um to good. maintain an open mind and to try to give evidence that does not fit my theory a fair hearing and i mean listen i am biased i i i, I like you have a hard time finding this particular data set completely convincing um, I do feel that it is ambiguous, but people, what, listeners might feel otherwise. I mean, I, I invite people to weigh in and say, like, do you feel like we are underweighting right. this data? They might, they might, they might. And then we'll learn more about how Windows saves files and get ourselves some yeah, I think that's a old good, school I think flight that's a good simulators. If there's a clamoring of voices saying um, you need to, like, really really get to the bottom of this, really understand this data really thoroughly, really understand how Windows works as an operating system. Okay. Seems like a good place to wrap it up. Maybe. I think we did a slightly low key one today and that's because we had some pretty intense ones in the recent past and we're going to have some pretty intense ones coming up. 
Yeah, so don't give it away this though. Is kind, this is kind of a breather, <laughs> <laughs> but I, this you, you called it the elephant in the room. This data exists. To some people, it is the smoking gun. Um, we respect their opinion. Period. Uh, this episode is brought to you by OnMilwaukee.com, which is my day job. A company I started 25 years ago. Daily Magazine and City Guide covers obviously Milwaukee things, but a whole lot more than that. And that's what allows me to be here and do this every day. And I want to get your Kindle book. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I did, is that I still did. out there? Can we put a, a link for that? Yeah, it's still there. I okay. will put a link there. I mean, I, I feel like it didn't quite excite the public imagination like MA370 because frankly, even though it was a kind of a crazy, incredible story, and I think the psychology of this guy was really fascinating, there was no mystery. I mean, it's pretty cut and dry what happened. The thing that makes MH370 such an endless topic of fascination is that we just don't know. Um, although hopefully this podcast will help put that to bed. Okay. Um, and then we'll, we'll bring that back to you next week, uh, next Thursday. We'll have new things to talk about as we get closer to the 10th anniversary of the taking of MH370, the name of Jeff's fantastic, easy to read good book which provide us with a lot of content for today yeah. uh jeff thank you for doing yet another one and thank you uh, andy let's, let's and thanks to our rolling. listeners for, for for bearing with us we appreciate it and we'll see you next week take care bye